Move over, Blackbeard and Calico Jack. It's Ladies Night. From a smoldering redhead with a violent temper and an even worse habit of burning down houses and stabbing her crewmates, to a common thief called Sadie the Goat because she knocked her victims to the ground with a well-placed headbutt to the stomach, including the last one on our list, the most successful pirate of all time, known for taking a hard line with her enemies, you know, just your basic nailing their feet to her ship's deck and then cutting them to pieces. This is the top five infamous female pirates of history. Welcome to Strong Stories, where we talk about the lives of influential women who made history. If you've watched my other videos, you know I typically like to focus on inspiring stories, but today, with these lady pirates, you're getting a taste of the dark side of powerful women of the past. Grace O'Malley is remembered today as Ireland's Pirate Queen, but in her childhood in the 1530s, she had a different nickname, Grace the Bald and she kind of had herself to blame for this as she shaved her own head to look like a boy because her father told her girls are not allowed to go to sea. On the other hand, the plan worked. Her father relented on the promise that she would be ladylike and go below deck if they spotted other pirates. Now, it might sound odd to you that her dad, Owen Black Oak, was concerned about pirates since he himself was a pirate chief, but I guess who said pirates don't fight other pirates? According to all the stories, Grace fulfilled her promise to be ladylike and high below deck by climbing up the rigging and mooning a pirate ship that was chasing them. She later saved her father's life by leaping down from the rigging with a blood-curdling shriek and jumping on the back of an enemy pirate who was about to stab him. The shocking distraction apparently turned the tide of the entire fight. Grace's family, the O'Malley clan, had built several castles along the coast of Western Ireland where they watched for passing ships then sailed after them and demanded a tax. Those who refused were attacked. However, it was unheard of for women to pirate with the men. That is, until Grace came along. After the deaths of both her husband and her father, Grace became master of the O'Malley's. Commanding 200 men and 20 ships, she raided merchant ships hailing from North Africa to Scandinavia, even daring to attack English ships, despite the fact that England was taking over Ireland at the time. Well, the sea brought Grace not just wealth, but also romance. Literally, a man washed ashore after a shipwreck and she took him as a boyfriend. But apparently the universe was really out to get this guy, as her rivals, the McMahon clan, who were jealous of Grace's success, tracked him down and killed him. Seething for vengeance, Grace led an expedition against the McMahon stronghold of Duna Castle. She seized it and ruthlessly slaughtered her beloved's killers. After this, people began to call her the Dark Lady of Duna. Grace then traveled to nearby Rockfleet Castle, knocked on the door, and told the owner, a man named Richard Ironburk, that she wanted both him and his castle. Shocked, but kinda into it, he said, I do. Soon with child, Grace was unwilling to give up pirating and one day found that her water broke while at sea. Within hours of giving birth to Toby of the ships, and yes, that is what she named her baby, her vessel was attacked by Algerian corsairs. Grace emerged from her cabin, half-dressed and angry, firing her musket and screaming at the top of her lungs. The shocked attackers hastily withdrew. Perhaps the most memorable scene in Grace's life was the time she sailed to London to speak with Queen Elizabeth. The two queens spoke in Latin as neither knew the other's language. Remarkably, good Queen Bess agreed to Grace's demands for better treatment and the release of several of her family members from English captivity. Grace died in 1603, over 70 years old. Like most people, Sadie Farrell believed brains could overcome brawn in a fight. But for Sadie, this was to be applied quite literally, as she always ambushed her victims with a swift headbutt to the place she believed they were most vulnerable, their stomachs. I suppose for men, this could have been quite a bit worse. 
In New York City in the 1860s, stories began to spread about this head-butting mugger, earning her the epithet Sadie the Goat. Sadie was born in the slums along New York City's East River, surrounded by cutthroats and thieves. Petite but vicious, she recruited men to knock her victims unconscious once she had stunned them with her trademark goat charge. She and her accomplice would then help themselves to the unconscious man's belongings, pilfering even his shirt and pants. But one day, Sadie met her match when she found herself in a drunken brawl with a six-foot-tall female tavern bouncer named Gallus Mag. No doubt to the delight of the tavern's male customers, the two went at it tooth and claw. For once, Sadie's headbutt fell short, and the goat suffered the indignity of receiving Mag's own trademark move, biting off ears. Humiliated and shorn of one ear, Sadie fled the east side, wandering wherever her feet took her. One day on the west side, Sadie was amused to see a group of river pirates attempting to board a small merchant vessel. The disorganized attack was easily driven off by the ship's crew, and many of the pirates were left severely beaten. Sadie approached the group and attended to their wounds and somehow convinced them to take her on as their leader. Under her direction, the group tried again, this time successfully capturing a much larger sloop. Raising the Jolly Roger to the masthead, Sadie captained the ship up and down the Hudson River, raiding everything from small farming villages to posh riverside mansions. They soon became so flush with cash, they needed several riverside hiding spots. Finally, when news spread that several farmers who resisted had been murdered, villagers along the Hudson organized instant attacks on Sadie's group wherever they landed, and police boats began patrolling the river as well. Sadie charged headlong into this fight, but when her crew started dying off one by one, she eventually gave up. This story has a happy ending in a piratey sort of way. Sadie the Goat returned to her east side haunts, even making up with Gallus Mag, the famous ear biter, and Mag, in a gesture of sublime magnanimity, pulled a jug of pure alcohol from the tavern shelf labeled Sadie the Goat's Ear and returned the prize to the delighted Sadie who kept the pickled keepsake in a locket around her neck from then on. Around 1697, Anne's father, William Cormack, an Irish lawyer married to a wealthy woman, got her servant pregnant. Whoops. Then he fled the scene in disgrace with his newborn child, Anne. Oddly, his wife was willing to give him an allowance so long as she believed the baby was male. So obviously, William dressed Anne as a boy for years and lived off the proceeds. This domestic bliss came crashing down on him when his now ex-wife discovered the truth about Anne and cut him off. William found a fresh start in Charlestown, Carolina as a merchant and later plantation owner. Now in her teens, Anne's eye-catching beauty turned heads on the streets of Charlestown, and her smoldering red locks were matched by a fiery temper. The teenage Anne was reported to have stabbed a servant girl and savagely beat a man who hit on her one too many times. But not all her suitors found such a reception. Anne began to frequent the town's taverns and inns, and it was said she was not particularly reserved in point of chastity. Anne married the man her father least approved of, a pirate named James Bonney. And as the legend goes, Anne's new hubby hoped to inherit her father's plantation. That displeased her father, so he disinherited her. But that displeased Anne, so she burned the plantation to the ground. The newlyweds moved to Nassau in the Bahamas, a lawless town sometimes referred to as the Republic of Pirates. There, James lost all Anne's respect by becoming a secret informant for the local governor, betraying many of Anne's newfound pirate friends. She soon ditched him for the flamboyantly dressed Calico Jack, with whom Anne put to sea disguised as one of his male crew. And at first, no one suspected a thing. Anne was an old hand, after all, at dressing like a boy. Donning a brace of pistols, a sword at the belt, loose trousers and tunic, and a cap to conceal her flaming tresses. 
and stabbed a fellow crew member who tried to pick a fight with her and regularly leapt into the fight aboard overtaken ships with gusto. However, her crewmates, showing signs of true pirate genius, started to wonder, is she a girl? when Ange started showing obvious signs of pregnancy. Calico Jack decided to leave her in Cuba to give birth. We don't know what happened to the child, but before long, Anne was back aboard Jack's ship where she was surprised to find her main man had taken another female pirate aboard, Mary Reed. Now you might think that Anne would have hated Mary's arrival, but instead the two became fast pirate friends. All was going swimmingly until one day in October 1720, when the pirates were still recovering from the previous night's drunken carousing, a British sloop of war bore down on the pirate ship. Anne and Mary exhorted the men to fight, but in their rum-induced stupor, the men tried to hide in their own ship. The two women realized they couldn't fight off the British ship alone, so they accepted the inevitable, and the entire crew was arrested and sent to Jamaica. Anne and Mary avoided being condemned to death by pleading pregnancy. The men, however, had no such luck. Anne was allowed one last visit to her former lover, Calico Jack, and her sweet and touching last words to him before he was executed were, had you fought like a man, you need not have been hanged like a dog. There's no record of Anne being executed, but there's also no record of her being released. A ledger in the same Jamaican town where she was tried records an Anne Bonnie dying 13 years after her arrest. If you are enjoying these pirate tales, give the video a thumbs up and let me know in the comments which has been your favorite story so far. Anne Dulavu, or Anne God Wants It, earned her nickname because her iron will always seemed to win out, as if God himself brought about whatever she desired. Born in Brittany, France in 1661, Anne was deported to French Tortuga as a teenager for some unknown crime. The French were known to find excuses to send women to their Caribbean colonies with the hopes that female companionship would encourage the men there to give up piracy, settle down, be law-abiding farmers. In Anne's case, this ploy backfired spectacularly. For Anne, marital bliss got off to a rocky start when her first pirate husband was killed in a fight, as tended to happen to Caribbean pirates from time to time. A year later, though, she loved and married again, only to see this promising second chance dashed again by a pirate fight. This time, though, Anne had had enough, and she challenged the buccaneer who had slain her husband to a duel after he insulted her. Apparently, killing her husband was one thing, but insulting her? That was over the line. As the story goes, the overconfident swashbuckler agreed, pulling out a dagger. His self-assurance, though, drained away when Anne drew a pistol never bring a knife to a pirate duel. Struck by a better idea, this fast-thinking gentleman of fortune, one Laurens de Graff by name, airily declared he would not fight a woman. De Graff, who history records as a tall, blonde, mustachioed, and handsome pirate captain, had decided on a different kind of conquest. Apparently, there are few things more alluring to a buccaneer than a beautiful woman pointing a pistol at his face. He proposed on the spot. Her late husband and the insult, apparently forgotten, Anne agreed at once, and the two put to sea. Unlike most female pirates, Anne refused to dress as a man, flaunting her femininity aboard ship and convincing her husband's crew that, far from being a harbinger of doom, as women were seen by sailors of the time, she was actually their good luck charm. Anne fought by de Graff's side in many battles, taking part in decision-making and urging her husband on in his piracy, earning her nickname, God Wants It. In 1693, the power couple raided English Jamaica, striking a blow for France and earning a title of nobility from the grateful French crown. According to one version of events, Anne witnessed a Spanish cannonball kill her husband. Furious, she led a boarding party against the Spaniards, but she and her crew were overcome by sheer numbers. 
held captive in Veracruz, Mexico, awaiting execution. Anne was now so famous that the King of France wrote personally to the King of Spain, asking for her release as a favor between friends, a request that was quickly granted. Anne was released and never heard from again. Despite his fame, the pirate Blackbeard never wielded more than a handful of ships manned by a few hundred men. Francis Drake and Henry Morgan commanded a few dozen ships packed with a couple thousand men. By contrast, Ching Shi commanded over 1,800 ships crewed by 80,000 cutthroats, making her by far the most powerful pirate of all time and possibly the most ruthless. We know little of Ching Shi's origins, we're not even sure of her real name, but we do know that around the year 1800, she worked as a lady of the night on a floating brothel near Canton, China. According to one version of events, in 1801, when she was 16, the infamous pirate Chang Wen, enamored with her beauty and intelligence, ordered the men to raid the brothel and kidnap her. Whatever the circumstances of their marriage, the savvy Ching Shi soon negotiated herself to an equal partnership, sharing booty and power equally with her husband. To call this arrangement rare would be a massive understatement in a time when women were considered little more than their husband's property. Ching Shi and Cheng Wen ruled with an iron fist. An Englishman held captive for ransom for six months by the couple in 1806 witnessed an officer who was taken captive having his feet nailed to the deck where he was beaten with whips until he vomited blood. And then he was taken ashore and cut to pieces for good measure. At the time of Ching Shi's marriage to Chang Wen, he commanded an armada known as the Red Fleet, consisting of several hundred ships. But rival pirate groups were competing in the same waters. With Ching Shi's guidance, Cheng Wen united every fleet under the couple's command, arguing that they could make more money pooling their resources rather than fighting amongst themselves. In 1807, Cheng Wen died, probably falling overboard in the storm. Ching Shi moved swiftly to secure herself as leader, marrying her late husband's adopted heir and lover, Cheng Po, who had risen to command of the Red Fleet. She won his trust as the new leader of the entire fleet, wielding the largest pirate fleet in history. Ching Shi successfully outfought the Chinese, Portuguese, and even elements of the British Navy. She branched out into legitimate enterprise like the salt trade, forcing her way in with violence where necessary, and terrorized hundreds of towns and villages along the southern Chinese coast. Any village which didn't pay her the protection money she demanded was systematically slaughtered. In 1808, she led a raid up the Pearl River, beating back the Portuguese and butchering some 10,000 innocent villagers who resisted her demands. Ching Shi maintained tight control over her pirates through a system of unbreakable laws. Anyone who disobeyed orders was beheaded. Booty was fairly divided under the direction of a purser. Unattractive female captives were released, but attractive ones were sold into slavery or prostitution. Pirates could marry female captives, but they must remain faithful to their wives upon doing so, and deserters had their ears cut off. In 1810, facing growing pressure from European navies who increasingly outmatched her fleet technologically, Ching Shi saw which way the wind was blowing. She negotiated an extraordinary deal with the Chinese government. Total amnesty for herself and all her pirates, freedom to keep her booty, and the right to maintain a small fleet under her husband's command for ostensibly legitimate trade. In return, she would disband her entire operation. When the emperor's representatives balked at these conditions, Ching Shi flexed her muscles by ordering ruthless reprisals against nearby coastal villages. Weary of the carnage, the government at last agreed. Ching Shi retired from her life of piracy and lived out her days surrounded by wealth and luxury. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this historical countdown, then check out my video on the top five female spies of World War II. If you want to say hello or let me know what you think of these stories, I will see you in the comments. And remember, you can do hard things. Be brave, be strong.